and by having all these wildlife in Southeast Asia, it attracts a lot of wildlife biologists from all over the world. And every now and then, some of them pass by Singapore, and we seize the opportunity to make them give us their ideas, their thoughts. So David happened to be on his way to Borneo for his bird watching trip. And the bad thing was that I found out about it. <laughs> and so I wrote an email to David and said, hey, you know, you've got all your work on Southeast Asian biodiversity, so maybe it might be a good idea to give a talk. So here we have reverse David uh, from Princeton. David is in the uh, Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy and in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. He's done a lot of great work in Southeast Asia, in India, in South America, and a lot of some of the most uh, energetic and most uh, inspiring young biologists today were trained by David. Some of them who are seated, seated in this room, um, they will probably introduce themselves later. Uh, but before I go on too far, I will just pass it on to David to give you his story and his views on conservation of biodiversity in South Asia. Thank you very so, much. Over David. to you. It's a real pleasure to uh, speak uh, with you this evening. What, I, what I'd like to do is go through some of the work that uh, people in my research group have been doing relating to biodiversity conservation in Southeast Asia. And as I hope you'll see, I actually owe a great deal to Singapore and to NUS for just about everything I'm going to talk about and really the direction that, that my career has taken uh, over about the last uh, 10 to 12 years. So uh, for me, it's a chance to in some way say thank you to Singapore for all the ways in which it's enriched uh, my life. <coughs> so just, I want to begin by just telling you a little bit about uh, my, my research group at Princeton. Um, and we're really focused, I think, on one question, which is how do we find space for biodiversity in an increasingly crowded, hungry, and hot world? And related to that, uh, I'd like to think that we take a solutions-oriented approach. That is, uh, we, we do spend a lot of time documenting problems, but we also try to think of solutions, or at least partial solutions to them. And that causes us often to work at the landscape level. I'm not a huge fan, uh, in many cases, of, of sort of global uh, meta-analyses and things, because I don't think they lend themselves to uh, practical recommendations. And I've never been a fan of little small site experiments, even though that's great science, just doesn't, I think they don't see enough birds when I do that. So uh, we, we tend to work at about that scale. Uh, I do really encourage folks to get into the field because I think if you're going to try to uh, solve a conservation problem, that experience uh, in the field, seeing the wildlife, talking to the people who are on the landscape is really important. And increasingly, as you'll see, uh, we bring in the social sciences uh, because. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, it's okay. I, I went away. It's gone. Okay. Uh, I hope it wasn't a warning about me. I, I, I hope uh, we increasingly bring in the social sciences because when you're trying to address these sorts of problems, it's really important that you have uh, recommendations that are not only scientifically sound, but are also economically feasible and socially acceptable. So you'll see a little bit of that as well. Um, and my overall approach to conservation science, which, which I will not claim is shared by everyone in my lab, uh, is really informed by the uh, seminal work of Jagger et al. '69, <laughs> who wrote, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need and aware of the uh, demographic uh, characteristics of this audience, I need to update that picture uh, so that some of the younger members can recognize uh, who I'm talking about. So you'll also see that that sort of element of, of uh, 
reluctant pragmatism come through at times. Uh, and just a last slide, the, the areas in which over the, about the last 15 years, uh, members of, of my group have worked, graduate students, postdocs, and such, uh, here. And you can see uh, increasingly uh, a focus in Asia. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work the group has done on the issues of deforestation and logging in Southeast Asia, and sort of a new area for us, the wild bird tray. Uh, so, Logging and deforestation, I do not think I need to uh, give much of a background to this audience. In fact, you could probably give me a better background. But particular interest in Sundaland, given the high levels of endemism and the really extraordinary rates of deforestation that have uh, unfortunately occurred here in recent decades. And so, uh, looking at uh, Sunderland and focusing on essentially the replacement of the greens with the flats and the grays, which shows deforestation. Uh, we know that by 2010, about 70% of Sunderland's lowland forests have been converted to agriculture, mostly oil palm. And at least in this 10-year period, the lowland forests are disappearing at about 1.6% per year. The peat swamp forest at a staggering rate of approaching 4% per year. Um, and, and this has, of course, been a main driver of the uh, work that the group has done, uh, focusing in particular on oil palm, at least initially, and then we've moved into matters of water. Um, and I want to begin my, my debt of gratitude to Singapore by uh, expressing my gratitude to Leon Pinko, uh, NUS graduate, uh, a uh, protege of the uh, late great Naljot Sodi, who came to graduate school at Princeton to work with me. He was only my second graduate student. And the two questions that Pin proposed to explore were, what does oil palm do to biodiversity? And can we make oil palm plantations more hospitable to biodiversity. And before Pin's arrival, I had been to Asia once in my life for about 10 days. And really, through Pin, the connections to NUS, through the other people who have come through the lab, uh, it's really where I got interested in this region. Uh, so that, that is certainly one uh, tremendous uh, debt of gratitude I owe. Uh, and Pin, looking at this question of oil palm and its impacts to biodiversity, focused on birds and butterflies, uh, doing a combination of field work and uh, gathering existing literature. Uh, I can justify this by pointing out that these are easily census organisms and that they are reasonable indicators for a lot of other taxa uh, and so on and so forth. But the truth is, Pin like butterflies, and I like birds. <laughs> and just to take you through a, an early paper, and, and the interesting thing is, groups, conservation groups in Southeast Asia were way ahead of the scientific community, other than a few people like Nafjot Sodi, in recognizing what was going on with oil palm. Particularly in North America, most of us uh, who called ourselves conservation biologists, who were kind of blissfully unaware of what was happening. So one of the things that Pim did, uh, using uh, data that had been gathered by a variety of people, in what was actually an early paper in the conservation science literature on this, was to uh, look at the impact of uh, logging, rubber plantations, and in particular oil palm on biodiversity. And I'm showing here a really simple metric which happens to be one that I like, which is you simply take the community of forest-dwelling birds that you find in an old growth, lowland dipter carbon forest, and you just ask the question, how many of those species persist uh, as the land undergoes various types of conversion? And so what, uh, what we found was, of course, the logging, it's a fairly uh, 
fairly intensive selective logging causes a, a reduction in the number of forest dwelling species. Um, but that, that loss is nothing compared to the loss that you encounter when you convert either a log or a primary forest to rubber or oil palm. And not unexpectedly, most of the birds that can persist in a rubber plantation can also persist in an oil palm plantation. Um, and then when we add butterflies, we have no data for rubber plantations, but you get qualitatively the same. Again, this is not a terribly sophisticated analysis. It was a very early one. The pattern is clear. Many of the researchers have done, frankly, much more rigorous analyses of this same question, and they come up with exactly the same answer. Uh, so it's clear that this step here, conversion of forest oil palm, is really, of course, devastating biodiversity. Again, something that many of you were well aware of well before those of us uh, in uh, academics in North America were aware. Um, but Penn, I, I think to his credit, wanted to go further. He wanted to see, well, can we make oil palm plantations more beneficial for biodiversity? And he did something that I quite liked, which was he took advantage of the existing variation in the way in which oil plant, palm plantations are managed to address this question. So some of the plantations allow epiphytes to grow up the uh, trunks of the oil palms, others clear them off. But that adds a little bit of structural diversity. Uh, some allow weeds to grow in the understory. And some oil palm plantations will even put flowering plants inside the oil palm for the purposes of drawing in uh, beneficial insects, usually the insects that they hope will prey on the other insects that are harmful to oil palm. And that's sort of one mode. And the other thing that you find is, for various reasons, some plantations will leave patches of forest inside the oil palm. So the question was, could all of these steps, individually or in aggregate, make oil palm plantations more beneficial for biodiversity? And this was something that Leon Pinco looked at. And I won't walk you through his results, but he doesn't make a difference. You know, you, you do all that stuff. You need your little patches of forest, the epiphytes up there, you have the weeds, and you maybe add one or two butterflies and one or two birds. It's really not uh, a terribly effective uh, or important way to sustain biodiversity. The best way to keep biodiversity in oil palm plantations is to keep the oil palm plantations out of the forest. Um, but there was some good news with respect to the management of oil palm plantations that comes from uh, my former student, Singli Guillaume, who is now assistant professor at the University of Tennessee and was also uh, an NUS graduate working under uh, Navjot Sodi. And Singli studied the impacts of oil palm on freshwater fish communities. And in particular, as one part of his work, we look at what uh, riparian buffer strips of forest separating the oil palm from the waterways does to uh, fish communities. And he found that they are actually very effective. That if you put in buffers uh, on the order of 10 to 30 meters, uh, you can conserve both fish species richness, the variety of fish, as well as the biomass of fish. And the latter is important because there are some communities uh, that derive some uh, protein from these fish. They aren't big fish, but, but they still nonetheless uh, feed on them. Uh, and he also found that these buffers work well even if the buffer forest is lightly used for timber, a little bit of selective logging for crop lands and things like that. Uh, now, obviously, the wider the buffer, the more beneficial it is for the terrestrial species, which was the second phase of this work. But in terms of protecting the remarkable uh, <coughs> fish fauna associated with Southeast Asia, in particular in the peat swamp regions, leaving a relatively narrow of buffer forest 
between the oil palm and the stream uh, does a great deal of work. So we've been uh, exploring these issues, and it occurred to me after a while that in the earlier stuff, the very early papers we were putting out, this sort of analysis, we, we just kind of had one category of log forest. And we weren't really looking at how uh, biodiversity might react to different intensities of logging. And I was able to bring together uh, a team to, to take a look at that question. And continuing my fairly evil rock uh, analogy, it's a little bit like putting together a band. So in this case, um, there was David Edwards on the birds. He's been working uh, in Danum for many years. He's an extraordinarily good ornithologist. On the dung beetles, Tron Larson, now at Conservation International. Uh, Wayne Shu, uh, who uh, until recently was with BirdLife Taiwan, and uh, is interested in both birds and dung beetles. And then Brendan Fisher, now at the University of Vermont. Uh, that's Brendan. Uh, and Brendan uh, was a, uh, or is, I should say, uh, an environmental economist. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why I brought Brendan in the future. But they all came through uh, my lab for uh, a few years. And basically, the question we looked at then was the impacts of uh, logging uh, on both birds and dung beetles. And here, I actually am on firmer ground in terms of why birds and dung beetles, because in fact, there are uh, a few reviews that suggest that these two groups are really good surrogates for a lot of the other taxa uh, in tropical forests. And so we looked at them, uh, bird and dung beetle communities in primary or unlogged forests, once logged forests, and twice logged forests in down. And just to uh, flesh this out a little bit, uh, the once logged forest in the area that we worked, they go in for the first cutting in the primary forest, and they remove all commercially valuable trees that are about 60 centimeters or more diameter at breast height. And since the forest is largely dipterocarps, most of the dipterocarps apparently have commercial value, it takes out most of the big trees. Uh, the plan is to then wait a couple decades and go in for a second rotation. They don't, the Malaysian Forestry uh, Department does not seem to wait that long. They'll go in seven, ten years later. On the second cut, they will take out all of the commercially valuable trees, 40 centimeters DBH or above. So by the end of it, you have a fairly uh, fairly trashed forest with uh, small trees, somewhat widely spaced. And David Edwards, who led the bird work, uh, used both mist netting and point counts to uh, survey the birds. And the dung beetles were sampled using baited pitfall traps. And the less I tell you about that, the <laughs> better. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to take you through the, the, the analyses and such, uh, but I'll summarize the main findings, which is that over three quarters of the birds and dung beetle species that we found in the primary forest were able to persist even in the twice log forest. Now, some of them were a lot less common in the twice log forest, but they were still able to persist. Only about 7 to 11 percent of the birds and dung beetles occurred only in the primary forest. I've put only in quotes uh, for an important reason, which is that is not a trivial number. I mean, that, that's one in 10 species. But it's uh, frankly uh, lower uh, than I might have imagined at the outset of the uh, Research. Now, I'll swing back to that in a moment. I should also say the whole issue of which species truly depend on primary forests, why, um, 
the uh, real expert on that is in the back of the room, uh, Luke Gibson. And so I would defer all questions to him. Uh, but in any case, that was what we found. And the main conclusion we drew from this isn't that logging is harmless, which it's not, but that even these twice log forests were not biological wastelands. We thought that was important because we might be tempted to write them off as, as we strive to protect the remaining primary forests in the region. And that would be a mistake because they really are not uh, depleted of all sensitive species. In fact, if we look at rare and sensitive bird species and we plot the mean abundance per point count for uh, rare and sensitive birds in unlogged, <coughs> once logged, and twice logged forest, unlogged, once logged, twice logged, and the mean species richness, the number of species of rare and sensitive birds in uh, one in primary forest, once logged, twice logged. One of the things you'll see is that unquestionably the primary forest comes out ahead. <coughs> but even in the twice logged forests, you have uh, both in terms of number of individuals, number of species, and not a trivial number of rare and sensitive species. So it's not as though what's left in the twice log forest are species we wouldn't care about that, that could handle uh, all of the pressures and do fine. And so it's important we feel that the value of these forests be recognized uh, and in particular, I'm going to go back, uh, the potential to protect them and then over time see them uh, grow back and hopefully have an ape fauna or a beetle fauna that more closely approximates that of the primary forms. There's an interesting economic side to this too, and this is where Brendan uh, Fisher, the resource economist, came into play. So, for, I don't know how he managed to do this, but David Edwards talked his way into the <coughs> local forestry office in uh, Saba and walked out with a briefcase containing uh, records of every tree logged over about a 10 year period on about 200,000 hectares. Um, and why they gave him those data, I don't know, but I'm grateful they did, because we were able to turn it over uh, to Brendan and ask the question, how much is the timber worth? And in an unlogged forest, the net value, sort of the profit we had, we calculated in, in the Danum area, was about $10,500 per hectare. And then we could calculate the net <coughs> value of the timber remaining after one round of logging and after two rounds of logging. So after they've taken out the first cut of all the trees 60 centimeters or above, the timber value drops. It's about $4,000 per hectare, net present value of timber remaining after that first cut. And it drops to about $2,000 per hectare after the second cut. So a fairly dramatic drop off in timber uh, value. What currency? Uh, this was done in US dollars, uh, inflation adjusted. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of a US bias, isn't it, that we do it in US dollars. <coughs> but we were aiming to publish in the North American journal. <laughs> we should have done it in ringgits. <laughs> more interesting. Now, let me give you a different perspective on this. Uh, which is, let's, let's take the number of species of birds, the understory birds that you catch in the mist nets, dung beetles, and let's say that the num the, 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 that set of species, forest dwelling species, non forest, forests, let's give it a value of 100%, however many there are. And then let's ask what percentage of those species remain after the first logging, a rotation and after the second 
uh, log E rotation. And you'll see that for the biodiversity values, if you look at that blue line, those blue lines, they, they dip, but they don't dip hugely. Again, that, that, that segment of species, 7, 10, 11 percent, that can't abide any logging, they disappear. <coughs> Many of the others become much less common, but they still hang on to <coughs> that drop. But remember, here's what happens to the timber value. That drops exceptionally swiftly. And so one of the arguments we've made is this space in here represents an opportunity to protect degraded forests at a lower cost. And conceivably, uh, over time, those forests will grow back into something better approximating the uh, original condition and, and perhaps even regain some of the uh, species associated with the older forests. I actually want to stay there for just a moment. Um, so you still have to deal with oil palm because there's money to be made by converting a log forest to an oil palm plantation. But if you imagine sites that for any number of reasons, regulatory, soil property, slope, aren't suitable for oil palm, then the remaining barrier to protecting them is their value for timber. And so we would argue that these log forests may be much less costly to protect lower opportunity costs, uh, and still retain a large part of the native fauna. And that, over time, again, we would hope that they would uh, get better and better for wildlife. And we think that strategically protecting log forests could be a way to enlarge existing protected areas, buffer the remaining <laughs> primary forest, and create either corridors or stepping stones between forest reserves. So that's an idea we've been uh, putting forward. Let me switch to the, the second part, which is the wild bird trade in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, these are some pictures I took uh, a couple of years ago in the uh, Kuala Lumpur bird market. And I became interested in this question when I was traveling in Sumatra and was surprised at how many homes in the smaller towns we went through had pet birds in cages hanging in front of the home. And looking at those birds, they were clearly not species that are readily bred in captivity. And then further research showed that the, the percentage of households in Indonesia overall that own a pet bird, I think some people say it's about as high as 20%, which is really quite extraordinary. So the issue related to this wild bird trade is that literally hundreds of species are sold in markets in Southeast Asia. We have no long-term data on the wild populations of most of them. And monitoring those wild populations is expensive, time-consuming, and requires specialized expertise. You've got to have people who can identify the birds by sight and sound. And that, that's a pretty limited skill. Um, so a question that, that I pondered was whether we could get reliable clues from the bird markets <coughs> as to which species were being overexploited, because that's what we want to know of these hundreds of birds that are being traded, hundreds of species being traded, which one should we be most worried about? And for that, I was able to uh, enlist the help of uh, Bert Harris, uh, who joined my lab for a couple of years and is now uh, a scientist with Rainforest Trust. And Bert studied the bird markets in Medan, Sumatra, the major uh, hub of the Indonesian bird trade. He did various things, but I'm going to focus on the work he did with the markets. So we have this problem. We don't have a lot of population data on these wild birds. It's not like North America where we have Christmas bird counts, breeding bird surveys. You can go back and get decades worth of 
population data. So in the absence of that, the best we could do was to find a list of experts, bird watchers who we knew were very competent and who had been working in Sumatra for anywhere from 10 to 20 years. And we simply asked them to assess the population trends for 32 species of birds, a mix of species that we knew were uh, traded in the market and species that we knew were not traded in the market. And we simply asked them, you know, have each of these species, tell us whether you think it has uh, increased, stayed stable, declined moderately, declined greatly over the span of time that you've been observing. And then, working with the Wildlife Conservation Society, we are able to get both market price and sales volume data for the same 32 species in the Medan market from 1987 to 2013. So, I want to, the way, we thought a lot about how to look at these data. The way I, I, I want to uh, present to you today is to say, let's graph, let's create a graph of their trends in this one. If the sales volume is increasing, it'll be along this part of the x-axis, decreasing in this direction. If the market price is increasing, show it as a positive trend on the y-axis, if the market price for the bird is decreasing, we'll show it uh, as a negative trend on the y-axis. So keep that in mind, and you can see we're creating four quadrants uh, based on whether the price in this quadrant, price is increasing, volume is increasing. This quadrant, price is increasing, sales volume is decreasing. In this quadrant, the price is going down, but the sales volume is increasing. And here, the price is going down, and the sales volume is decreasing. So keep those quadrants in mind, that idea. And then I'm going to shift it just by the way the numbers worked out. So, so here's that zero, zero point. And I'm going to plot what we know about the increase or decrease in sales volume, increase or decrease in price of those 32 birds. And I realize this graph doesn't show well. I apologize for that. Um, but we'll begin with the birds here in this pink box and these little red triangles. These are birds that, uh, in this quadrant, all of these species are increasing in price but decreasing in the sales value. Price is going higher and higher. Fewer and fewer of them are appearing in the markets. And they are overwhelmingly the species that have been identified by the local experts as severely declining in the wild. Similarly, this group of birds, which are largely clustered in the box where the sales volume is increasing, so more and more of them are appearing in the marketplaces, but their prices are also going up. Those were birds that were largely categorized as declining by uh, the experts who we asked to assess the trends of these birds. And then you see here that um, in the, the, these blue triangles of birds where uh, that sort of overlap these two where the sales volume is, uh, I'm sorry, the market price is yeah, maybe increasing, maybe decreasing. The sales volume uh, could be increasing, could be decreasing. And all of these were thought by the experts to be stable or increasing. So that's sort of the breakdown. Again, we wish we had more precise population trend data. We only have that for a couple species of highly endangered birds at the bottom line. But you see the pattern there. What we found is species that are increasing in price and decreasing in volume are in trouble. The experts all agree that they're rapidly disappearing. They may not be species that have appeared on any sort of uh, red list of threatened species. Because we tend to make those categorizations, frankly, based largely on habitat issues. But the bird trade is independent of that. 
birds that are increasing in price and increasing in value, well, they may be in trouble too. Um, if the price is going down over time, it's likely that the bird species isn't being severely depleted in the wild. And the interesting thing we found is that these sorts of market surveys <laughs> can be done at about a 30th the cost of field surveys. So we're hopeful that if conservationists and scientists pay more attention to the markets, we may be able to identify which birds are being overexploited sooner and more cheaply than would otherwise be the case and can design the appropriate interventions uh, to protect them. But I should point out what really worries me about pet bird trade in Southeast Asia and wildlife trade in general is it poses sort of a double hit, a double whammy against so many species because of the combination of habitat loss and trapping. So Bert found evidence of trapping even five kilometers into the forest. I had sent him backpacking into those forests to try to get some population data on some of the really coveted birds like uh, the Sumatra mountain thrush and stuff. And as far in as he could go during his field season, he found uh, evidence of trapping. And in fact, when we interviewed the trappers, they're kind of a friendly bunch, actually. Um, the, uh, Five kilometers also happens to be the median maximum distance that they tended to travel on a trip. And the trappers confirmed that birds that we couldn't get any data on, the Sumatran laughing thrush, Sumatran silver mesia, were formerly common. And in places where we looked, we couldn't even find them. So clearly, these guys, these trappers, are having a big impact. So take a look here. Uh, in Sumatra, about 70% of Sumatra's forests, especially the lowland forests, are gone. Converted to agriculture, oil palm, things like that. Nearly half of the remaining forests are within five kilometers of a major road or village, which means essentially those forests could be completely depleted of some of the most uh, coveted songsters. Not only that, that's a major road. You add in all the minor roads that we can't detect using Google Earth. And you can see that Subatra songbirds probably occupy much less habitat than we think. They're really getting hit both ways. The last area that we started to look at, and I hope we can continue, is some of the social dimensions of the wild bird trade. Um, and this is work that's been led by uh, a new postdoc in my office, uh, Zuzana Bariva Lova. And uh, as part of this work, we interviewed 762 bird odors in Medan and found that 84% had at least one wild caught bird. So most of the bird owners, the vast majority, own wild caught birds. And over half of them had only wild caught birds. So we asked them what their reasons were for owning wild caught birds. And they cited three most frequently. The first, the most common reason was the lack of access to captive bred birds. The second, a perception that the cost to acquire captive bred birds was higher than the cost to acquire wild birds. And among a small number, the idea that the captive bred birds have poorer songs than the wild so we try to understand more about this. And this raises the issue, could captive breeding programs lessen pressure on wild populations? Um, there are, you would think it might, because they said, well, one of the reasons I own a wild bird is I don't have access to a captive bred one. But there are some downsides that we would have to know more about. What about the risk of boosting the demand for particular species? And providing an route to launder wild-caught individuals if there's a captive market. That's the same reason that um, most conservationists vigorously oppose any sort of legal ivory trade, is that they're afraid it will be an access route to legitimize or to launder the illegally uh, obtained ivory. Uh, nonetheless, I think there's an interesting issue as to what we could do to get people to choose 
domesticated species instead of native species and wildlife species. If instead of things like shamas, um, people could be made to want to own canaries or budgies or uh, some of those species. Um, and so let me wrap up, because uh, I know uh, it's running late. Some final thoughts. Um, I think, I'm always I'm optimistic, pessimistic about the future of biodiversity. We like both. And I don't think there's any reason we can't be both pessimistic and optimistic about the future of Southeast Asia's fauna and flora. There are a lot of really troubling trends. And a lot of these problems are going to get worse. But at the same time, uh, you do see growing interest in the environment in many of the Southeast Asian countries. We have a better handle on what the problems are. And people are beginning to develop solutions that, that could uh, reduce some of these threats. Uh, and I come back to something I, I said at the beginning, which is that successful conservation requires solutions that are scientifically sound, economically feasible, and socially acceptable. And that's really, in my mind, a plea for more research that combines uh, ecology with the social sciences, including things like economics, sociology, psychology, to really try to get at these issues. And then lastly, if I can um, perhaps overstep my bounds a little bit, I think Singapore has a critical role to play in saving Southeast Asia's biodiversity. And we could talk about the many dimensions of that role, but certainly one of the factors uh, is simply uh, the combination of economic power and incredibly talented, highly educated uh, young people who really can assume uh, not only a national leadership role, but an international leadership role. And maybe that is one of the reasons we can all uh, maintain some optimism. So thank you very much. Thank you.